Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar tonight on the topic of media literacy and presidential campaigns, which is particularly relevant today since today is election day in the U.S. So I'm Cindy Scheib. I'm the executive director of Project Look Sharp here at Ithaca College in upstate New York. And for those of you who are not familiar with Look Sharp, we're a grant-funded media literacy initiative providing professional development and curriculum materials for educators to use in their work with students. So we focus primarily on K through 12 and college education, but our materials and our approaches are easily adaptable for community groups, for parish groups, um, homeschooling, and, and lots of other educational contexts. So you should know that all of our curriculum materials, including images and video clips, such as those used in tonight's webinar, are available free of charge for educators through, through our website, projectlooksharp.org. And this webinar is part of the first National Media Literacy Week in the US. So you can just go online and get more information about that and a schedule of events. And now I've, I'm delighted to introduce the leader of our webinar, Sock Sperry, who is a program affiliate of Project Look Sharp and our main curriculum writer. So I'm going to turn it over to Sox. Thank you, Cindy. Delighted to be with everyone tonight. And um, happy election night for folks. I'm sitting here with a little label that says I voted a few hours back. We didn't have a lot of choices in my local campaign, but nevertheless, there were some. Um, and I'm referencing that as we look at this opening graphic here. Uh, and maybe linger on this for a moment, <clears throat> just to reflect on our idea that media literacy itself is, of course, about accessing, analyzing, um, inquiring about, and reflecting on media documents, but leading us toward action. And in a democracy, we're talking about an action that gets people engaged. <clears throat> I also want to say that Although I'll be probably using the word classroom, students, teacher, uh, myself a, a background as a, a teacher in a number of different settings, both in school and out of school. I know that not everyone attending tonight is in a school setting. Not everyone attending tonight um, would therefore be using these in a classroom, per se. But what I'm hoping is that the materials that we'll be putting out tonight, the dialogue that we'll be having, will be useful for you as you move from access analysis to evaluation and action in whatever setting you're in. And as was said before, we really want this to be interactive. So right from the get-go, we'll start with the chat. For those of you who have not attended our webinars before, whenever we're inviting you to type into the chat box, there'll be a small text box in blue, a little bubble with chat in it. And I think we'll just start with this. What is it you notice about these media documents relating to our current presidential campaign? I'll be quiet while you have an opportunity to just chat a little bit about these two media documents. And whatever noticing should come up for you. I know multiple people are typing, and I would encourage everybody here to get involved in the conversation. I will say that I chose these documents on this topic because, as Cindy said before, our, uh, one of our primary focuses has been issues around sustainability of late. So we really wanted to inquire right out of the gate about how our candidates are responding to urgent issues that relate to sustaining life on the planet. And with Karen's first response on framing, 
<clears throat> one of the key things we'll be talking about is the constructive nature of media documents and what those frames are, who's making them and why. Uh, as Carl points out, headlines themselves, even before you get to the text and pictures, oftentimes tend to steer how we uh, look at things uh, one way or the other. I'll be intentionally pausing from time to time, so if you hear dead air, don't worry. We're, we're still live and, and um, working the webinar, but giving people a chance to type themselves without me talking the entire time. I think I'll move on from this one. Even as you're typing, please feel free to keep doing that. Um, although before I do that, maybe I'll just respond. Michael's point about bias is a really key thing, of course, that we're working with, with whatever audience, um, community groups or students, talking about the issue of bi bias. We all bring our own biases to media constructions and also to media analysis. So it's an important word to be using right up front. Um, and Karen's also raising the point about who owns the media. So uh, this is really important in terms of the ownership of the media uh, conglomerates that oftentimes are feeding us news, not always conglomerates that we're aware of and ownership that we're aware of necessarily. So I'm going to move on. As people are typing, feel free to continue the conversation and respond to one another say a little bit about what our goals are for tonight. We will be touring Project Look Sharp's materials that are related to presidential campaigns. They're included in the Media Construction of Presidential Campaigns kit that's free and available online, as you've been told a number of times already. I'll also be exploring six key concepts in media analysis throughout the course of uh, this evening and understanding why uh, ways that we can use a wide variety of media forms. When we're talking about media here, we're talking about media as a way of communicating with people at a distance across time and space. And although we're often used to referring to media as mass media created by corporations in the present new media sense, we're also at which are curious about media that uh, pre-existed uh, Fox News and uh, Rupert Murdoch's um, conglomerates. The six concepts, key concepts in media analysis that I uh, hope you've downloaded, it'll be available for you through download, are also available on our website to you. If you look for them in the future, uh, you can see on the left hand uh, bar where you click on. And I'll be covering each of these key concepts in turn as we go through the the uh, webinar tonight. So the first key concept is that all media messages are constructed. To use Karen's language, there are frames around which we view uh, media and frames also that are used to create media constructions. This particular document comes from the website Inside Climate News. They made international news that small group recently because they broke an important story about Exxon's research into climate change way back in the late 1970s and early 80s, and then their uh, failure to report their research that concluded that anthropogenic climate change was a real problem for human race and the planet. Um, so that's inside climate news. And this is a page of theirs on where cl candidates stand on climate change. So the same question on this. Uh, since we're looking at the reality that all media messages are constructed, what are you noticing about the constructions of this media message?
Karen's, of course, making the point that conflict sells. And here you have the green team and the red team selling conflict around climate change. And Michael's right, of course, not all candidates are included. So the construction was, who are we going to put on this limited space and why? Michael also talking now about purpose, which is one of the key things that we'll be focusing on. Not only is there construction, but there's also construction with a purpose behind. The intention to shed light on one party in a positive light and one negatively. In a classroom, if a student said this, we then ask, what's your evidence? Where do you notice the placement um, that you recognize as positive and as negative? And we would talk about color, placement on the page, perhaps the, the, uh, the actual image that's selected, the quote that's selected. So this kind of evidence is partly what we're looking for when we're doing what we call constructivist media decoding. Um, green up and the stop sign down. What I'm hoping you're recognizing from this as you're following the chat is that there are so many different places you can go with this as a teacher or discussion leader in your community. Um, and you have the opportunity as a facilitator to go with any one of these and ask deeper questions. Why do you think that? Where's the evidence that supports that? Anyone have another read on this? Um, so I think it's important to be able to to use these materials in a, in a creative way and then have a conversation that's actually constructed by the people who were present, following what their particular interests and focuses might be. The second key concept that we'll focus on, each medium has different characteristic strengths and a unique language of construction. As you can see, this is the cover of our Media Construction of Presidential Campaign kit. And on this cover, you'll see a number of different kinds of media forms, each of them having different, again, characteristic strengths and their own languages of construction. Uh, if you're using this in a high school history class, might be an interesting slide to put this up and ask students to see if they can identify the different types of media and um, recognize a political cartoon in the very top left-hand corner that we'll see later on toward the end of our um, our time together. I want to comment that the, the middle slide on the top row, which is hard for you to see, but you'll be able to get a better view if you uh, were to download the kit cover from, uh, from our site, is actually an image of people pushing a giant rolling ball that has text on it. And this was actually the scroll of the time. This is the 1830s, uh, 18, late 1820s, early 1830s. Uh, campaign media, as it were, people would gather in the public square, and it took a <clears throat> half dozen people to actually roll these giant balls through the square. It's where the phrase, keep the ball rolling, first started. And it's an early media form, not one that many of us would recognize as such. So here's another chat. What are some differences you notice between these two categories of political media? on the left and on the right. Different channels. Karen, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by different channels? different methods of delivering content? And is there a differentiation between the methods selected for the left and the right? Of course, this is my own media construction. I'll own it. I pick these particular images. Um, so what differentiates the sign button uh, campaign song from the ones on the right? Just some of the differences. more grassroots, lower tech. An opportunity to talk about media is not only 
created necessarily by people with millions of dollars to spend and vast teams, but also something that could happen in a living room or around a, a table together. From simple to complex, black and white to color, electronic, non-electronic. And also the difference between an individual form of expression, as Lauren's saying, and an expression that's actually created through uh, necessarily groups of people working together through technology of a higher order. Also gives us an opportunity to talk about what we mean by interactive media as opposed to non-interactive media. Slogans or exchange. A really interesting point about framing with FDR, uh, again, rare that you'd ever see an, an image of him uh, in a wheelchair, although that's how he uh, lived for the greater part of his um, later adult life. And uh, so, again, I just want to point out, these are opportunities to take these conversations wherever you'd like to go in your classroom, both following what your intention is as a teacher or group leader, but also following the particular interest and focus of the group itself. Let's take a look at a particular media form, and that's television. And of course, within TV, you've got differences um, of forms within a single medium. So what are some of the differences you notice between these forms within the single medium of political discourse? Uh, document A, a film biography shown at the convention, typically. Document B, an ad, political ad. And document C, you might recognize as a debate. All men. Really critical discussion then about who gets to be standing on these podium. Um, document A, arousing sympathy, connection, and Romney's is a put down. And again, in a classroom, if I'm working on media literacy analysis skills, I'll be asking, what's the evidence for that? What is it that you recognize in the first image, document A, that arouses sympathy connection? And what do you recognize in document B that's a put down? So we might talk about facial expression, uh, placement in the image, color, words associated with the image. These are opportunities to just take it deeper. Um, and each, and allow, each allowing a different level of interpretation. Cindy's talking about the fact that certain documents, A and B, created by particular campaigns to lift up or put down an adversary, whereas C, uh, sort of more generally inviting the voices of multiple different candidates. <laughs> Document C looks like a game show. This is an interesting discussion. So how people set up the diocese, um, and uh, what's the intention behind the actual setup of the debate? Really interesting. So once again, the key concept in media analysis that we're talking about, each medium has different characteristics, strengths, and a unique language of construction. And in a media literacy sense, that's what we're looking for here. The third key concept that we'll focus on we've already touched on, and that is that media messages are produced for, for particular purposes. Of course, we understand that there's purpose, explicit or hidden, behind these media messages. So let's take some time and reflect on these. What do you think the intended purpose is for each of these media messages? And more than one of us 
probably miss John Stewart's presence here. So there's another question that Lyle puts in, which is about target audience, which of course also has to do with purpose. So in addition to what the producers are trying to accomplish, one of the questions is, um, who are they trying to, to target? Who are they focused on? So that would be an interesting question for each of these as well. Who are the target audiences? And what are the particular purposes here? And again, Juliana notes that it would be younger people. In a classroom setting, I'm going to ask, what tells you that? And, and um, really probe it a bit. Are there elders who listen to hip hop? Are all young people listening to hip hop music? So that we really begin to bring nuance into this as well, and not just sort of a, a black and white dualistic perspective on things. Font size also has to do with message. So Patty, I'd love to know more about that if you'd talk about the font size or the font type as well. Um, you'll notice that the type uh, below the Hip Hop for Obama is a different typeface than change.gov, which is the, uh, the website of President-elect Obama in the period between his election and his inauguration. The purpose of B is entertainment. Lots of discussion in recent years in the Stuart Colbert era about the distinction between entertainment and information. Is there one? Really important to be talking about that. Doc B and C's font doesn't stand out. Um, Karen, I did not know that. A famous black artist designed the image in Doc A from Boston. So I assume, Karen, you mean the top image of uh, looks like flags and almost looks like the St. Louis Arch. Um, I, I was not aware of that. So this is also an opportunity to invite your students, participants, community members to help fill in the picture. I hope you understand that Partly what we're doing here in an inquiry-based education process is to say that the questions and the responses themselves, the process, is more important probably than what um, a lecturer might tell you in this particular work. Um, we're looking for more information that comes from our audience, our students, from our participants. And to Elaine's point about adults, entertainment, and satire, again, in a school setting, and we'll talk later about satire, well, great opportunity to talk about what is satire. Um, and are there young people who watch John Daly? Um, and are there adults who were not interested in watching John Daly? Why? So an opportunity to really go deeply into this question about purpose and also target audience. So it's possible, as Karen points out, to recognize something as parody uh, and still turn to it for information. It's also a springboard. If Stuart talks about something or did in the past on The Daily Show that you don't know anything about, it's an opportunity to then, to then say to your students, why don't you find out about what, uh, where that um, quote came from that he used? Or where did that image come from? Who can figure that out? So this is an opportunity. Now, Patty's talking about um, the icon itself, for her, recognized as a put down of America. And this is a conversation, then, if we were uh, together and had longer time to be able to really focus on why that might be. One of the things we'll talk about later on in this uh, interactive seminar is how to have conversations like that that might be heated, where people have very different perspectives about things, and do it in a, such a way that we maintain civility, mutual respect in the process. And of course, this is partly what 
uh, we're trying to do when we're, we're engaging with media literacy is just not to differ, but to understand how we can do that in a way that's, that's uh, respectful. I appreciate Karen's question about this, too. I'd love to know um, also uh, why Patty felt that that would be demeaning. Um, because they're, again, in media constructions, they're not just constructed by the producers, but they're also constructed as we receive them, which is one of the further key concepts that we'll talk about. Cindy's making a point, of course, about whether or not students recognize Stuart and Colbert as satire and humorists. And so it's especially important to talk about satire, humor, parody, um, irony. What do these mean? An opportunity to really go deeper. And, and one of the sets of media documents that we'll be looking at will really allow us to do that. Uh -huh. So one of the questions that Patty's raising is, what does it mean to repurpose, take an, uh, an icon like the American flag and to repurpose it? Um, should we be allowed to do that? Not why um, as a candidate in particular? So this allows us to have a conversation. We will not all agree about this, but it's an opportunity to really take a look at that in a deep way. And you'll notice that there are other icons here, the presidential seal, that are used in different ways by John Stewart and by uh, President-elect Obama's team in document C. So there's another question. Are the uses of the presidential seal in document B and C um, for what purpose? Are they both respecting the office, yes or no? As Karen points out, symbols have morphed throughout history, and as they morph, there's conflict. There's contention. Uh, and of course, oftentimes, that draws media as well. Cindy's uh, actually jumping ahead of me, and that's great. I appreciate that. Uh, one of the key concepts that we're going to get to, number five, is that people use their individual skills, beliefs, and experiences to construct their own media meaning from media messages. So this is an opportunity to really state this truth. Let's move on to the next one, which gets us into the whole question about satire and not. And this is uh, the fourth key concept that all media messages contain embedded values and points of view. And before we show this, I want to talk a little bit more on a topic that we uh, that I touched on before, uh, partly because the image that I'm about to show you, some of you may already know which one it is, had to do with the 2008 campaign, is one where we actually had some debate within our Project Look Sharp office uh, and among our advisors about whether or not to use it as a media document. And we agreed that we needed to because this was a media document that was getting a lot of visibility. And although it contained some challenging material that would potentially be hurtful to people, because it was out there in the public, um, we really thought it was important for students to have an opportunity to unpack this, to decode it, to talk about it. Um, in the classroom because we had a good sense that it would be happening outside the classroom. So a few notes on do no harm, which is sort of our shorthand for this. Um, be aware of the power of media messages and the potential for unintended consequences, such as reinforcing stereotypes. Uh, contrasting negative or potentially harmful messages always with positive media representations and queuing into and following up with students' emotional responses to documents. Really important when you're presenting something that's potentially um, hurtful to be especially engaged with the students in terms of their emotional responses. And of course, that means listening well to the meaning making of your students. 
So here's the document I'm referring to. The cover of the New Yorker, July 2008, during the general election campaign between Barack Obama and John McCain. And we're going to do a poll. Kelsey, I'll ask you to pull the poll up. Um, is this magazine cover satire or libel? That's, I think we're going to, this is a different slide. Um, when we go back to it, actually, Kelsey, if you can get back to the slide, I want to give people a chance to look at it a bit more before we, um, we move to the, um, the poll itself. Thanks for your patience. We'll get back to the slide in a minute. Again, a New Yorker cover, um, and the question was, uh, yeah, let's, let's linger for a minute here, Kelsey. I didn't realize we needed to, to go off screen to do that. Again, for use in a classroom, we're defining satire, uh, using definition from Merriam-Webster, literary work holding up human vices and follies to ridicule or scorn, or libel, a written or oral defamatory statement or representation that conveys an unjustly favorable impression. So um, this is an opportunity now. I think now, Kelsey, if we can get to the poll. OK. I'll give people a chance to just take a minute and work on the poll. And I see that people are weighing in already on it. We'll let people take a few more minutes to, I, I notice that people are continuing to vote on the poll. And the chat question is why? Why do you recognize it as satire? Why do you recognize it as libel? Kelsey, I think we can end the poll. About three quarters of people recognizing, identifying this, analyzing this as satire, about one quarter as libel. Again, an opportunity for a rich conversation in the class, one that must be framed around mutual respect, do no harm, and be very explicit about that. Um, as people are typing in uh, about why, this magazine cover might be satire or libel. Um, if you're using this in a class, you might want to ask the class for agreement on appropriate responses before you show it. No laughter, side comments, mocking, for example, um, even before you begin. So Karen's made a couple of important points here. One is someone of my generation, I'm in my 60s, will probably recognize some of the symbolism, the iconography here, uh, in a very different way than someone in their teens might. Uh, and also react to it differently as a result. And it's also pointing out that, of course, the audience for The New Yorker um, might understand this. I might point out that the title of this image was The Politics of Fear. Uh, which in itself helps to frame the meaning. But of course, that wasn't on the cover itself. The cover spoke by itself. Satire because the image meaning is making fun of the media's representation of the Obamas. And so Lyle is also reflecting on 
again, some background information that's rather important about the New Yorker itself, um, its history, its audience, its reputation, why you might see this in that particular context and not in another context. And Cindy's point is that another person might have looked at this and said, I guess he really is a Muslim, having seen the magazine and not being familiar with it at all. They might think, well, it's just telling the truth. OK. Um, would you use it in your classroom or in your public setting? Why or why not? I'm going to pause for this for a while. It's an important conversation. Patty, would you say a little bit about why you would not use it? Absolutely. So Lauren's raising an important issue, and that is uh, talking about the audience uh, for those of us who are teaching. We've been talking about the audience for a media document, but we also need to be reflecting on, of course, the audience for those we're teaching with, grade level, maturity, background information, whether or not you've successfully talked about contentious issues in your setting before. Um, many of us feel that it's important to teach about controversial and difficult topics. Many of us do it on a regular basis, and yet we really need some training capacity to be able to do that in a way that helps people um, come away with a sense of mutual respect and deeper understanding. Keeping away uh, kids from critical issues presents, prevents them from understanding the real world. Lots of wonderful comments here. Opening dialogue, the importance of not preventing students from framing their own um, thoughts about the topic. And deconstructing media texts is to create an informed citizenship. One thing that the discussion in this webinar and in a classroom or community setting allows is an opportunity to then have a dialogue about it that doesn't happen when I'm just reading this or looking at this cover by myself. There is something that happens when we're working together at this, as we are in this webinar, that helps us um, deepen our own understanding of this. And because our students are so dominated by images, as Lyle says, we really need to teach students how to analyze images. So please keep typing. I do want to talk a little bit about the, the way we frame this in the context of our lesson. And I think this is rather important. Um, for us, just showing it and having a debate was not sufficient. What we really wanted students to do was to grapple on a, a deeper level with the pros and cons of using material like this. So what we did was we found actually six. You're only seeing five here. Um, six different perspectives that were editorial perspectives in response to the New Yorker cover because it was so contentious, three that supported its publication, three that criticized its publication with very different perspectives. And we wanted the students to read the excerpts and then discuss which of the writings most represent their thinking. 
So this is also an opportunity to get students involved in the discussion, but if they don't have the kind of background and analysis that some of the writers would have, it's an opportunity for them to learn a little bit more about both the candidates, the history of the Black Panthers, the uh, suggestion that uh, candidate Obama was a Muslim, uh, but also about satire um, and politics. So for us, we couldn't simply show the cover and leave it at that. We had to take the next step in order to help them uh, read more deeply into the lessons. I want to read what Milena says here. If we learn to read these images, we would prepare to read others, thinking about them, not just arising feelings. So we need to recognize that feelings will come up, but we also have to have ways to frame the, the discussion so that students are learning more to think critically, to ask questions of one another um, in a way that will really help further the dialogue and discussion. So let's move on to uh, another lesson <coughs> that we will reference. Um, this is media analysis key concept number five. Cindy referenced this before. People use their individual skills, beliefs, and experiences to construct their own meaning from media messages. So it's not simply a matter of uh, receiving as is what a producer uh, or a media creator might have created, but it's also coming from our own lens. So uh, I just want to note here that the purple text box at the top for each of these that you've seen tells you exactly where you can find these documents uh, and associated materials, questions, um, background information, further questions, and the uh, campaign kit. And this one, it's document number seven in the uh, 2008 media construction of presidential campaigns. What I'm going to do is show you five different images that relate to um, the topic of whether candidate Obama was a Muslim. Um, the first of these is the text of an anonymous email. And for those of you who may not be able to read it on screen, I'm just going to read the highlighted section. This is an anonymous email. Uh, that was sent out January 2008. This is relatively early before the Iowa caucuses in the 2008 campaign season. Let us all remain alert concerning Obama's expected presidential candidacy. The Muslims have said they plan on destroying the U.S. from the inside out. What better way to start than at the highest level? With the President of the United States, one of their own. Triple exclamation points. Several days later, January 10th, from Annenberg uh, Political Fact Check, factcheck.org, um, dueling email, chain emails, claim he's a radical Muslim or a racist Christ Christian. Both can't be right. We find both are false. So uh, quite different view, perhaps, than the um, anonymous email you just saw. This is from a blog, danielpipes.org, titled Barack Obama's Muslim Childhood. As Barack Obama's candidacy comes under increasing scrutiny, his account of his religious upbringing deserves careful attention for what it tells us about the candidate's integrity. This comes from candidate Obama's own uh, web page called Fight the Smears. Um, and the highlighted section the lie, Barack Obama is a Muslim. The truth, according to the Obama campaign, Senator Obama has never been a Muslim, was not raised as a Muslim, is a committed Christian. Further, this myth perpetuates unfortunate falsehoods about the Muslim American community that are often offensive to people of all faiths. And the final document is actually a reflection on all of these, this whole chain, and this was a story that came out in June. Most of those documents you saw were early in the year. Um, and Dr. Danielle Allen uh, did a research study looking at the origins of this accusation. The attack that came out of the ether, a scholar looks at the first link, 
in an email chain about Obama. And so the chat question that I want to ask, um, when we look at all of these different sources, which we presented to our students in our curriculum, what questions might you ask your students about this very diverse collection of media documents? The questions oftentimes every bit as important as the answers. What are the questions you might be asking about this? And I'll be quiet while you think about some of the questions that might fall into this category and um, write them down. The key question. Good point. Who produced them? Who produced the media document? I want to argue that many of these questions that you're asking are central to all good media literacy teaching. Who produced this document? For whom? Who's the target audience? How does this reflect the public opinion of Barack Obama? And a, a corollary question, how might it shape public opinion about uh, Barack Obama? Again, who created? What's the author and creator's purpose? What role did the particular medium play in informing or misleading the public? Great question, because the role of an anonymous email is different from the role of um, the Washington Post uh, analysis, uh, and different again from the Obama campaign's uh, response. What's the role of the images themselves that are chosen? which claims show references to verifiable sources. This is a great opportunity to work on issues of credibility, um, sourcing, which is central to the work of me good media literacy education. Yeah, why was the rumor so compelling that it wasn't so easy to refute? Certain rumors that went up about Obama didn't get this kind of traction. This one did, why? And who benefited and who was harmed? Again, key questions. Uh, these are questions that resonate through so many different media documents than what we might use. And it leads us to fundamental questions about what news is and what's tabloid. Uh, back to our prior question about um, also about libel. Why is being a Muslim deserving of an exclamation mark? And why is it stunning? So really looking deeply at particular word choices how critical that is, and an opportunity to look at media ethics. I want to go back to the key concept that this is, uh, we hope, illustrating. People use their individual skills, beliefs, and experiences to construct their own meaning, meanings from media messages. So part of the purpose for me as an educator of pulling this collection together, asking questions and asking students to ask questions, is to help students develop skills to deepen their own capacity to understand their own meaning making. I want to note that each of the prior three uh, document sets that we showed are available in the 2008 um, presidential campaign collection. Again, all free and available to you. And there's a thematic listing at the beginning of this that you might want to take a look at. We're just showing here. Uh, documents from 2008, but the actual thematic listings themselves go back to 1800. So if instead of looking at the elections chronologically, which we oftentimes do as we're teaching history, it would also be interesting to take a look at the issues of um, media bias or race as present in um, presidential campaign media construction, our target audience throughout the ages. And that's why we put these together as thematic listings for you in case you want to organize um, a reflection, particularly over the next year as we're moving into campaign season or we've been there for a while, uh, deepening that movement uh, by looking at issues of media bias. Yep. So the last one we'll focus on is media analysis, um, key concept number six, that media and media messages can influence beliefs, attitudes, values, behaviors, and the democratic process itself. And so 
what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you a, a video that's available on the uh, Project Look Sharp video page. If you were calling up our home page on the right-hand side, there's a little button that says video. It will take you to this page. And the media decoding examples are particularly good professional development opportunities for people interested in how this might actually work in the classroom. And so we're actually going to use a media document back to 1800, one of the very first ones in our kit. Um, and this is a demonstration of how to use a media decoding in a classroom uh, in an American history context. And as you do this, we'd like you to be chatting yourselves about what you notice about the teaching process that supports a democratic process as you watch. Kelsey, go ahead. All right, this is from 1800. It is a political cartoon. Do we have newspapers in 1800? Yes. Yes, yes we did. Uh, the history of this country. And do we have political cartoons in 1800? Yes. Obviously. Obviously. We have this one right here. Who's the character on his knees? Thomas Jefferson. Yes. The, the election of 1800, do you remember? He was running against? Do we remember? John Adams, <laughs> uh, who was the sitting president of the United States. This is the first contested election where it wasn't clear. And in fact, a sitting president was uh, lost the election. Uh, so it was a very, very important election in American history in terms of the first time that someone who had power relinquished power in, a, in, a nat in a, an election. Uh, and his opponent took over. So Thomas Jefferson, would you suggest this is from Jefferson's campaign or from Adams' campaign? From Adam. Adam. What makes you say that, David? Just the fact that it looks like the guys watching over over the evil taking the I'm not really sure. Constitution. Constitution strong. Yeah, so what are the messages about, about Jefferson here? That he's trying to burn the Constitution, that he's trying to unravel like the American ideals that they had just put together. Yes. And Carmen, what's he burning it on or trying to burn it on? The altar to Gaelic des I can't read that. Despotism. despotism. What the the altar of Gaelic despotism? In your readings? The French, French Gaelic, French, French, French Revolution, 1800. I'm starting to put that together now. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson, so he was attacked because he was pro French Revolution. So and what's the message, John? He is trying to burn the Constitution, but I think that's one of the ways that he's pro anarchy. Pro anarchy he's, in this case? Like they're suggesting that, not that he necessarily is. Excellent. Who's going to stop him? Uh, America. 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 What do you mean America? The eagle. The eagle representing? Freedom. Freedom. Strength. The people. Who else is going to stop him? God. God. What makes you say that? That uh, giant eye. The big <laughs> eye looking there uh, from above. No. Yeah. It's interesting because when I first saw this image, I, I actually kind of felt as if um, it wasn't a, po a, a poster or a, an image that was... Um, Criminalizing uh, Thomas Jefferson, I I kind of I notice a kind of an internal bias in myself. I kind of see the um, eagle as as more of a negative image, and and the eye of God seems more of like a a, a, a scary, really awful image to me. So your first impression, based on your relationship to these symbols, was to see the eye and the eagle as negative. Yeah. And therefore, be more pro Jefferson. Yeah. Speaks really importantly to how we all interpret media messages through our own lens and our own perspective. The eagle kind of looks like some wild beast. It doesn't look very like glorious. It's it looks kind of yeah. fat. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Excellent. To, me, to me, Jefferson looks kind of righteous. Like, you know, yeah. 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 I definitely see that. Cast, yeah. it's cast down like a press. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. There are a few other symbols. What do you got uh, writhing around the altar of? Of Gaelic the despotism, snake. the snake that typically the snakes, you know, a pretty negative yeah. uh, image there, there as well. Some skulls, right. some, some skulls, skulls. and if you knew some of that history, so so there's a context that would have had most Americans in 1800 understanding more quickly that message. But from your perspective, it's harder to interpret, and that's really true about political cartoons. They have a lot of information and a lot of cultural and historical context.
So we're getting close to wrapping up, but I do want to ask people to just respond to the question, what is it you notice about the teaching itself that supports a democratic process, which of course is what we're looking at here when we're talking about uh, the origin to democracy and media literacy education. Uh, Carl says he asks a lot of questions, but then make sure that the students back up their answers with evidence from the document. This is always really key and important that we ask our candidates themselves, what's the evidence that you're giving for your assertion? Um, Karen's pointing out the importance of affirming student ideas as well. We want to encourage dialogue, and we all have been in or recognized settings where students' comments are cut down by other students, by teachers, advertently or inadvertently, this teacher is trying to bring conversation forward. Um, and teachers supporting all responses, although you, I also want to point out that oftentimes the teacher is supporting the response by asking for a, a second question. Well, where do you see that? What do you mean by this? Um, what do you notice about this? The critical aspect of allowing students to speak and hear their own voices. That's central to this idea about media literacy education. It's part of the reason why we really wanted the kind of rich dialogue that uh, I felt we had today, listening to one another with different perspectives. We want the same thing to go on in a classroom. Open questions, tying comments to other students' comments, really critical. Um, and the questioning was very deliberately um, developmental. Simpler questions first, what did you notice, what's your evidence, how does this tie to what we just saw before, what we've been studying about? Um, these kind of uh, questions that are developmental both support the teaching of core content around American history, but also help students develop a better understanding of media literacy process. Um, and allowing students to reach the objective of the lesson itself which has to do with democratic process. Student-led discussion, celebrating learning and curiosity, and reinforcing key knowledge. Great. Um, Take-home points for this webinar. Please encourage students to recognize the reality of the constructive nature of all media documents. You might want to share with them the key points of media literacy in that regard. Sharing a wide range of media forms, as we did tonight, always asking why it was produced, and then questioning the embedded values and points of view, and recognizing how we each make our own meanings um, from media constructions, oftentimes quite different meanings. And that it's important, as we did at the end, I hope, to tie media analysis to democratic process itself. There's some more resources I want to point you to available at the Project Look Sharp website, all free, of course an article on media construction of presidential campaigns if you're particularly uh, teaching to this topic. Um, that can be found in the articles uh, tab. And then also the Teacher's Guide to Media Literacy. Uh, Cindy Scheib, uh, who you heard at the very outset, and Faith Rogo have written probably the most important collection for teachers on how to really implement critical thinking in the classroom in a multimedia world. Great book. Also, for those of you who are interested in doing it yourself and creating your own classroom lessons based on the current campaign, um, I encourage you to go to the tab that says DIY Guide. Lots of helpful information about how to conceive of lessons, selecting documents, designing, lessons, uh, designing questions, and uh, elements of the lessons themselves. Lots of good material here if you want to mine it for your own uh, lesson construction, which is what we're really trying to encourage. So great websites for TV ads and newspaper front pages as media documents relating to presidential campaigns, the Museum of the Moving Image, as you can see, and the Museum Front Pages archive. Really great opportunities to bring uh, contemporary immediate images into the classroom or into your setting. I also want to point out that, uh, as you can see on the left-hand slide, uh, we have a whole archive of past webinars, including Critical Thinking of Health, Energy Choices, and Food Justice most recently. So if you're interested in these topics, 
other pedagogical slants, please check these out. Our next webinar will be on meeting constructions of Martin Luther King in January, just before his birthday. We encourage you to come, let other people know about it. Um, and finally, I want to thank you for joining us. There is a survey available. It would really help us if you would take that survey. Um, this uh, webinar will be archived. And I will stay on the line afterwards, along with Cindy, I think, <coughs> to answer any questions that you might have. Um, wonderful to be with you tonight. And um, enjoy the rest of election night. Cindy, I'll have you come join me. And if there are questions, we'll, we'll answer. Sure, that sounds great. And we would, we always believe that feedback is a gift. So we would love to have your feedback on how this webinar worked for you. The, the survey is really short. It's a Qualtrics survey, pretty easy to do. So if you would just take a couple of minutes to do that, that would be lovely. And uh, we look forward to continuing these conversations um, with everyone during not just the coming week with Happy Media Literacy Week. I love that. Um, but also over the course of the next year, a year from now, on election day. That would be great. And someone's calling in with a comment. I actually have no <laughs> idea. Um, so, so thank you. That Glad that Sherry's here to answer the phone. So it's been a real pleasure. So we'd be delighted if you want to join us for questions. Um, and if you'd like, you could turn your... Um, Kelsey, can can people turn their um, microphones on? So if they want to make a comment um, or ask a question verbally, we could um, allow them to do that. And Sox, maybe you can answer the question about the Minions cartoon. I will. Michael, it's hard to see right now, but there is a URL at the bottom, um, as we put with all of those, kegel.com, um, and uh, listed under finance rules as a place for you to uh, to check that out. Let me just make a note about uh, fair use for us, um, that all of the materials in our curriculum kits, many of them are copyrighted. But for us, we use them under the fair use provision, um, the exemption of copyright law. And, um, and Renee Hobbs and a lot of others, Pat Ofterheide, have written a lot about the importance of teachers being able to use media documents in their classrooms um, uh, under fair use and without, uh, without having to violate or without violating copyright law. So um, for us, being able to use something like the Minions uh, comic is fair use as long as you critique it and use it in a transformative way. If you just slap it on your website or a handout as, as uh, humorous, that's the way it was intended to be used. And then that is a copyright violation. So as you use um, media materials, please pay attention to those issues as well. Um, it's fair use to, um, to, to critique and to use something in a transformative way. Michael, thank you for putting up that, um, that resource. I noticed you did that a number of times. Really helpful. And if people are still on, uh, anyone available to follow up uh, with Michael about the conference call that he'd asked about before during Media Literacy Week with another school, um, that would be great. There you go. So anybody else who has a question or a comment. We'd love to to continue this conversation. And um, it looks like everybody would be able to turn on your, your microphone if you'd like. I don't know if anybody has. So Luella, love that name, 
um, has, is asking whether anybody's tried to turn on their microphones, if anybody wants to. Um, and maybe everybody is really busy doing the survey, which would be perfectly fine. So we're going to stay on for a little bit longer um, to see if anybody has um, any comments or questions, wants to continue this conversation. We do have lessons about political debates in our curriculum kit, starting with the very first presidential debate, which you guys probably know that the very first debate between presidential candidates was not until 1960, um, and then between Nixon and Kennedy. And that scared everyone so much that no one had a debate until 1976. So. Um, so the history of political debates is really intriguing, um, and you can find uh, several different places in our kits where we've used presidential debates. Also, Back just in other... terms of looking at, looking at history, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which were not presidential debates per se, but debates actually um, uh, took place in the campaign for Illinois Senate in 1858, but became quite famous themselves as early debates between candidates. And um, I really like this particular lesson. It's uh, document number one in the 1860 uh, campaign. Um, there's an image of, of Lincoln um, from the time <clears throat> that is a really interesting decoding image. And then a number of headlines from different sources as you can imagine, with very different takes. In particular, back then, newspapers tended to be sponsored by political parties. And so if you look at the second document there, you'll see a series of really interesting headlines um, about the debates that are also, for those of you who are teaching history, a uh, good opportunity to talk about uh, framing bias, um, credibility, going back 100 years. Well, I think, okay. Cindy, I'm going to uh, sign off at this point. Uh, anyone who's still there, once again, really appreciate your participation. That sounds fine. We'll see you in January. That sounds great. Thank you, Sock, so much. And I'll stay on just for a little bit longer, see if anybody else wants to join in. Karen, really looking forward to connecting with you um, to continue this conversation. I'll be teaching media literacy and popular culture in the spring. And uh, in the same way that Michael, who's who's I think has now logged off, was asking to connect with um, with maybe other uh, students um, to have conversations this week. I'll share that with Chris. Um, I would love in the spring to be in conversation with other college level classes or high school classes. Um, to follow the election um, stuff that goes on in the spring. The last time I did it, 2008, and in 2012, it was just fascinating for us to follow everything that's been going on.